postulated by Yukawa. And then a particle was discovered that was not the right man. So Yukawa won the Nobel Prize. So that particle turned out to be the new one. And the prion wasn't discovered until 1948. But indeed, when it was discovered, it did exactly the thing that Yukawa said. So he actually deserved the Nobel Prize anyway, even though the experiments got it wrong. Um, very quickly, I think, after 1948, the k and the lambda were discovered in cosmic rays. And then um, the accelerators came into the game in the early 50s. And so then, very rapidly, all the rest of these particles were discovered. Um, and as I say, hundreds more over the period from the early 60, 50s to the early 60s. The capstone was the discovery of the omega minus, which I think was in 1962. And it was just about that time that people uh, worked out what the systematics of these particles should be, which I'm now going to describe. Okay, other questions? Yes? Do you mind saying why you have the group of eight and the group of ten? Oh, um, yes. These particles here, spin ahead. And these particles here are spin three halves. And so in that way you can naturally associate them together. Oh no sorry, I mean why do you have eight? Oh I'm going to explain that to you now. We observe we observe a group of eight particles with the quantum numbers I've described. Um, and there's one more quantum number that I didn't describe clearly. So the quantum numbers that I described last time were the charge, the isospin. So it's a fictitious spin, and we can classify multiplets of particles under this spin. So the pions are an isospin 1 multiplet. The kaons are a multiplet of isospin a half, and the antiparticles of that multiplet. The proton and neutron are an isospin a half multiplet, and the delta is an isospin three halves multiplet. So spin three halves has four states, isospin three halves has four states. There's one more quantum number, which is called strangeness. And strangeness was observed to be conserved in strong interaction reactions. So these particles up here have strangeness 0, these have strangeness 1, and these have strangeness 2. The K plus has strangeness minus 1. And so a reaction that you would see is, for example, um, pi plus and a neutron going to a sigma plus and a K0. So this is a par these particles have zero strangeness. This particle has uh, strangeness one. This particle has strangeness minus one, being in the same isospin multiplet as this one. And then one doesn't see um, sigma plus pi zero. In addition, these particles in isolation are stable with respect to strong interactions, although they can decay through the weak interactions. So the idea is that the strong interactions conserve isospin and strangeness. The electromagnetic interactions violate isospin because the proton has a different charge from the neutron. And um, the weak interactions will violate both of these. And all of those, all of these statements will find a natural explanation within the standard model as the course proceeds. Um, when we get to the weak interactions, I hope, all of these non-conservation things will become clear. Now, it's also true that the things with strangeness have a different mass. So the mass splitting here is about 120 MeV. Similarly here, maybe 130 MeV, here about 130 MeV. Um, these are particles with strangeness minus one, strangeness plus one. These guys all here have strangeness zero. So somehow things with extra strangeness are also heavier in a certain regular way than things with zero strangeness. 
So as I said, if I were giving a full-length course in particle physics, we would now spend a week discussing all of the systematics and trying to work out deductively what the explanation is. But for the purpose of this course, I'd just like to tell you the answer. So the answer was worked out by um, Gelman and Zweig in about 1963. And what they noticed was that this whole structure would arise if you postulate three elementary spin and a half objects called quarks. And they needed three kinds of quarks called UD and S, or up, down, and strange. These are spin and a half. These guys here are an isospin doublet with zero strangeness. And this guy is an isospin singlet with strangeness equals 1. And so then you can naturally build all of these states out of these quarks. So let me just briefly explain how to do that. And then I think you'll learn more about this when you do the problem set. The easiest place to start is the uh, i equals 3 halves uh, uh, decaplet, the multiplet of 10. If I start with the state of three up quarks with their spins parallel, this is a spin three halves state, which also has isospin three halves. So it's exactly what I need to make this corner of the particle here. I need something with isospin three halves and spin three halves. If I apply isospin lowering to this, I'll generate states with UUD, UDD and DDD, all with spin 3 halves. If I change an up quark for a strange quark, I'll generate three more. And similarly, I'll generate a whole multiplet of 10 states. Um, the merit of these states, the property of these states, is that the three quarks are in a totally symmetric situation. So the capstone is the three strange quarks in a multiplet, in a totally symmetric state, making the omega minus. If I now use a quark and an anti-quark, I generate a set of nine states which have the form u, u bar, d, d bar, uh, d, u bar, and u, d bar, u, s bar, d, s bar, um, s, d bar, and s, u bar, and s, s bar. So there are nine states of that kind. Um, these nine states organize themselves into an isotriplet. So this thing here is isospin uh, 0 plus 1, an isotriplet, an isosinglet, two isodoublets, which are antiparticles of each other, and another isosinglet. And you see that's very clearly displayed here. An isotriplet and an isosinglet, two isodoublets that are antiparticles of each other, and another isosynchron. If we give the strange quark a little more mass, so inside a hadron, if I say that the mass of the up and down quarks is about 300 MeV, and the mass of the strange quark is something like 450, oh, plus or minus a few, then I also explain the mass pattern. Every time I add a strange quark, I add another 120 to 150 MeV of mass. That explains the mass pattern of every multiplet except this one, which is a special case and which I'm going to actually devote a whole lecture to next week. Yes? If you're asking about UD and UD bar, are there any triplets that are different? Yes. How do they become something that's even metastable? Why do they just annihilate each other in a way? Oh. Um, well, they do annihilate. But um, so, so the question is, what do they annihilate to? Okay. So um, 
Remember, the pi zero is unstable, I told you yesterday, with respect to turning into two photons. So if you have a bound state of a U quark and an anti U quark, they can annihilate and turn into two photons. And also the eta, actually both eta and eta prime have these two photons. But these are electromagnetic decays. So these are eigenstates of the strong interactions. And then they decay electromagnetically. Um, they, they're eigenstates of the strong interactions because there's nothing lighter to decay to. So where can they go? So they need something else to go to. That lighter thing is given by the photon. The eta also has a decay to pi plus, pi minus, pi zero. Um, these guys all, as I told you yesterday, have odd parity. And actually having odd parity is a property of a two fermion system in, L in the L equals zero, zero orbital angular momentum, as Callum will explain to you this afternoon, I think. Sorry? Okay, they will, as you will discover this afternoon. And so an odd parity thing has to, if it decays to odd parity things, it can't decay to two, it has to decay to three. So this mode is also a decay of the eta. Um, an, an analog is positronium. You can make a bound state of an electron and a positron. It lives for a microsecond, and then it annihilates either the two photons or three photons, depending on its quantum numbers. So these are just the analogs. Of these Again, why the mass pattern here is messed up, will that requires a separate discussion. But let me say it is understood, and you guys will understand it. <coughs> Okay, now the only thing that I haven't explained are the, the basic baryon multiplet of spin a half. And let me just say that there are, um, obviously if I can make a combination of up quarks or up quarks and down quarks with spin three halves, I could rearrange the spins and I can make another combination with spin one half. So now the question is what's the principle that picks out a group of eight? And let me demonstrate that by just doing a little uh, numerical estimate here. So we have three quarks, each of which has two spin states. So in all, we have three times two, or six, quark states. The decuplet I describe by taking a completely symmetric state of three quarks. So if I have a completely symmetric state of three quarks, I can make all of the states in the decuplet, as I showed you. So let's count the number of completely symmetric states of three quarks. It's six times seven times eight divided by three factorial, which is 56. Okay, how many states are in the decuplet? There are 10 states. They're spin three halves. So they have um, four angular momentum states. That only accounts for 40 out of the totally symmetrical states of three quarks. So there's 16 left over. And 16, you will notice, is exactly 8 times 2. So I claim that if you make all completely symmetric states of three quarks, so this is, if you like, three quarks all with L equals zero in a single bound state and in a totally symmetric configuration, there are 40 states that are accounted for by these. There are 16 more, and those exactly have the quantum numbers of these states. And in the problem set, you will construct those states and there's a nice little exercise there to verify that it's the right answer. Okay? Does that totally answer your question? Okay. Now, there's one more, two more things that are weird about this. The first one is the charges of these quarks, the electric charges that are needed. So if you remember, I said that the delta plus plus is made of three up quarks, but it has charge plus two. So we have to assign this guy charge two-thirds. 
Similarly, to explain the delta minus and the omega minus, we have to assign these guys charge minus a thing. So that's weird. Um, it's especially weird because we don't see fractionally charged things in nature. And people have searched extremely hard. Um, for example, people grind up clams from the seabed with the idea that clams filter a lot of water so they could have picked up stray charges and put them through uh, 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 spectroscopes. They take odd materials. People have ground up moon rocks. Um, no evidence that there are fractionally charged objects in nature. So somehow, if these quarks exist, and I believe the evidence that hadrons have quarks inside them is very strong. We'll see some bits of that in this course. And there's one lecture in the notes I'm going to skip, which if you read it, gives more evidence for this. Um, the evidence that there are quarks inside hadrons is very strong, but the quarks don't get out of hadrons. So somehow, um, we should have a picture where a hadron consists of two quarks, for example, a U and a D bar. And then there's something which we might call a string that goes between them. And the string can't break. Or if it does break, when it breaks, what we always get are an extra quark-antiquark -quark pair. So we can never have this string not end. We can never have a quark trailing a string that just ends and leaves us with an isolated uh, fractionally charged object. Now why this should be, I think is it's not a mystery, but um, which is to say it is understood, but we don't understand it at this level of the course. And I'll give you some hand-waving arguments for it. Um, I think I'm not going to give you a complete explanation for that, but maybe if I don't satisfy you, you can come and talk to me privately. Um, there are ways of understanding why that occurs, but we need a lot more formalism to get there. Um, now, the other thing that's odd is that quarks are fermions. And fermions are always in anti-symmetric states. That's what the Pauli exclusion principle says. But to make the baryons, we have to put three fermions in a symmetric state. So there's something that we don't understand here. And various people, um, Han and Nambu, Gelman, Greenberg, others, realize that you can fix this problem if quarks have one additional quantum number, which is invisible. So Gelman decided that it would be good to call it color. And so quarks also have another quantum number. They have a spin, which takes two values. They have the flavor, UDS. And then they have another quantum number, which is called color. And color, if it takes three values, and if you're totally anti-symmetric in color, then you're totally symmetric in everything else. And so the way you make baryons is you have something like epsilon IJK, F alpha I uh, G beta J H gamma K, where you're totally anti-symmetrized in the color index. You have an arbitrary spin, and you have an arbitrary flavor. And I've just counted. That gives the multiplet of 56 states, which are represented here. If you now add orbital angular momentum, you can be slightly anti-symmetric in spin and flavor and compensate that for some slight anti-symmetry in the orbital configuration. And then you can get more complicated baryons, the lightest of which are actually observed. And then over on the quark-antiquark -quark side, if I have, um, for example, U D bar, and I have an arbitrary spin configuration, and then I make this equal color and sum over I, that's also a, um, a configuration that seems to be allowed. A way of saying this is that color is a group SU3. And what's allowed are the singlets of that group. Those are the things that are allowed in nature. And everything else somehow is promoted to extremely large energy. So we'll come back to this SU3. 
I think in Wednesday or Thursday's lecture, I'll give you another indication that this number three, that these guys somehow have three internal uh, quantum states, um, is actually something that's visible in nature in other ways than just the hadron spectroscopy. Okay, one more thing I need to tell you about quarks. There are more than three. There are actually six that are known. The heavier ones are called C, B, and T, or charm, bottom, and top. Um, those particles are all rather ephemeral. They decay through weak interactions to the lighter quarks. And when we study the weak interactions, I'll discuss the phenomenology of that in some detail. Okay, um, that's your introduction to what the elementary particles are, at least on the matter side. And um, if there are any questions now, now would be a good time to ask. Yes? Get those factors six times seven times eight. Oh, if I have something with six states, and I take a totally symmetric combination of three of them, that's the rule. N times n plus one times n plus two divided by three factorial. Okay. So if I take, for example, the symmetric combinations of two of those objects, there'd be six times seven divided by two which would be 21 of them. And you can just count it. That's right. Yes? I didn't quite follow when you said that you can't have like only quarks. Yes? Is it something that doesn't make sense theoretically, or is it just something that we haven't seen experimentally? It, it's something that makes sense theoretically, but we need to get a lot more sophisticated to understand. And so if by the end of the course you're not satisfied with that, um, we can talk some more about it. Okay, I mean, it's, it's something that was a mystery for a long time. But I think now people have come to grips with that and kind of convince them. Okay, um, so now we know what the actors are, what, what particles we're going to look for. And so now the next question is, how do we look at them? So now I hope you all brought your computers. And you have the figures on the wiki? Today's, OK. So I hope you will all open up to the figure file in today's lecture. And first of all, I just want to start by showing you some pictures. So. When we collect data on elementary particles, of course, elementary particles are in a very inaccessible corner of nature. And so what we have to do is to uh, use some special equipment in order to try and find the properties of these particles. And in fact, um, nowadays, this equipment is extremely large. Um, you guys probably all know that right now, the premier accelerator in the world is this thing called the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. It's 27 kilometers around. And the individual detectors at the Large Hadron Collider, um, well, two of them at least are enormous. Uh, the largest one, called Atlas, is uh, literally 10 stories high. And so the question is, um, why do you need that? <laughs> How do you understand what comes out of these detectors? And I think you guys are all theorists, but still theorists need to know how to grapple with the kind of data that comes out of these objects. And so I wanted to give you a little introduction to that so that when I show you some data in the future, you have some idea of how actually these data are collected. So I'm not going to start with the LHC. The process that I'd actually like to start with is the process of electron-positron annihilation to um, quarks and leptons through the a resonance called Z0, which is part of the weak interactions. So if you collide electrons and positrons at just the right energy, which turns out to be 91 GeV, then you make a particle called the Z0. The Z0 has a width of about 2 and a half GeV, which corresponds to a lifetime of about 10 to the minus 23 seconds. 
it then decays in a characteristic way to pairs of quarks or leptons. So the visible decays are to um, quark antiquark, E plus E minus, mu plus mu minus, and tau plus tau minus. And there are also invisible decays to pairs of neutrinos. In fact, as we'll talk um, when I get to this topic in the course, you can actually count the number of neutrinos. And it turns out that you need exactly three neutrinos to account for the number of invisible decays of the Z0 that are observed. So that's a nice check on what I was telling you in the previous lecture. OK, now the question we're going to talk about today is how do you visualize these decays? And so um, in order to, to see those things, you need a handy-dandy particle detector. And so um, on the first figure, which would be page two of this PDF, you will see a picture of the detector built by my friends called the SLD detector, which operated at Slack. You see it has a basic structure where um, electron and positron beams come in from the two sides. Uh, this technique of using colliding beams allows you to go to a much higher center of mass energies than using a single beam on a fixed target. Um, then there's a certain point inside where the beams are scheduled to collide. Um, the speed of light in convenient units is anyone? Sorry? No, not one. <laughs> if you want to measure something, the speed of light in convenient units, and you should all memorize this, is one foot per nanosecond. I'm serious. So that gives you a good idea. A nanosecond is a unit of time that's well separated by modern electronics. And so if you have a nanosecond clock, at every tick of that clock, a relativistic particle will go one foot. And so with convenient timing, you can work at distances much less than a foot, which for those of you who are brought up in strange parts of the world is about a third of a meter. <laughs> and um, then uh, you can kind of clock things along. Um, so, uh, so in a nanosecond, you go a third of a meter. In 10 nanoseconds, you'll go three meters. In 25 nanoseconds, um, what is it? You'll go, what's, oh, my brain isn't working. <laughs> what, seven, seven meters or something like that. Um, 25 nanoseconds is the uh, bunch crossing time at the LHC. So at the LHC, you have the interesting property that protons come in from the two sides. They come into one of these huge detectors. They go, um, what, seven and a half meters. And so there's a collision. The relativistic particles come out. When the particles get to here, the next protons are coming in and colliding. And then these collisions go out in waves like that. And your detector has to be fast enough that you can recognize the difference between these waves as they propagate out through the detector at the speed of light. OK, that's one reason why these detectors have to be sufficiently large. We'll see some others in this lecture. In any case, what you see in that picture is that the SLD is designed in rings. So you have a cylinder here that does one thing, a cylinder out here that does something else, and then you have to nest these successive cylinders in the right way so each piece can do its job. Uh, the, the second figure, page three of the PDF, has a photograph of the SLD detector under construction. Down in the bottom corner, you can see a little golf cart. So that gives an idea of the human scale. Even this previous generation detector is really extremely large. On the next page, you'll see some event pictures from these detectors. And what you see is that the detector somehow can visualize these events in a very interesting way. In fact, what you see in that picture is that the four kinds of visible events that I showed here have very different character. Um, the electron, uh, what, what you see in the upper left-hand corner is an event with quarks. We'll talk a lot more about that kind of event as the week progresses. But as you see, it's very complex with many tracks. Although, interestingly, the tracks all line up in one direction. 
for reasons that we're going to discuss in the next couple lectures. The next one is the electron. So the electron goes out. The electron and positron make tracks. But then they also deposit energy in a layer here. And that energy deposition is recorded by the two towers that are visualized in this picture. If you have a muon, it's the same thing, except you don't deposit energy in that way. The muon just goes right out. If you have a tau, the tau decays. And so in the bottom corner, you have an event which is somewhat intermediate in complexity between a quark and a lepton event. And so what you want to do is not only to make these pictures, but have measurements that will give you the precise character of all of the final state particles that you observe. In general, as I said, most particles you're interested in decay very rapidly. So what you see are pions, kaons, muons, electrons, maybe some long-lived particles like sigmas or k-zeros. And from those, you have to go back and reconstruct what the parents were and what was actually going on in the event. So the question now is how you do that. I think the next few pages are close-up uh, figures of these various kinds of events. OK. So roughly, there are two different kinds of measurements one would like to make on particles. The first kind of measurement we could call tracking. And the second kind of measurement is calorimetry. So this specifically refers to charged particles. And this is a total energy measurement. And if you have a segmented calorimeter, the place where you deposit energy can also be part of the picture of how energy flows in the event. And so let me try and explain to you how these two kinds of measurements are done and what some of the criteria are for choosing the kind of material of the detector. So the simplest case is tracking. Let's talk about that first. So you folks all know, and I hope, ah, here's an interesting question. So you all studied Jackson's book on electrodynamics at some point in your career, or some comparable book in electrodynamics. How many of you actually read the chapter about the passage of charged particles through matter? There's an excellent job of this in Jackson's book. And I think if you want to really become an elementary particle physicist, it's worth devoting a couple days to the study of that. So roughly, as you all know, if you have some material and you have a charged particle that goes through it, that charged particle will brush by atoms. It will kick electrons out of atoms. and those electrons will then be ionization. If you have something that picks up free electrons, you can see those electrons being kicked out. And those electrons will visualize the track of the particle. So the first thing you need to know is what is the energy loss? And then the second thing you need to know is what is the medium by which you do this visualization? So the energy loss is given approximately by the beta block formula which let me write in this simplified form, dE dx, so the energy loss per centimeter, um, 4 pi Avogadro's number appears, the um, classical electron radius, um, the electron mass, um, Q squared, the, um, the charge of the particle, uh, Z over A, so this is the nuclear charge and the atomic number of the particle. 1 over beta squared. Beta is V over C. That's the velocity of the particle. And then there's some extra logarithm. 1 half the log of 2 gamma squared beta squared uh, MC squared over um, some typical atomic frequency uh, minus beta squared. And one can develop this formula in increasing sophistication. 
And then you can actually go to a material and measure it. So um, this is a kind of intermediate sophistication listing of what's there. It depends on the nuclear charge. It has a logarithmic dependence on the gamma of the particle. Gamma is uh, E over M, or 1 minus V squared over C squared, as you guys all know. Um, so roughly, uh, more dense materials will have more ionization. Um, materials with a larger atomic number will have more ionization. Um, relativistic particles will have a logarithmically increasing ionization. Although, to get the largest ionization, you want to take advantage of this. So slow particles have a large ionization. And so in principle, when a particle gets non-relativistic, it very quickly, one says, ranges out. So it continually loses energy until finally it stops somewhere. And in some experiments, you want to take advantage of this. For example, um, people do experiments with muons where you intentionally have enough material to stop the muon. It gets captured by some nucleus, and then it decays in that environment. And then you can study mu muons at rest that way. Um, the whole systematics is shown on this page. We're up to, could someone help me about page five or six? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry? What is the omega here? What is the what? The omega in this formula. Omega? Oh, this is a, a typical atomic resonance frequency. I mean, 10 EV or something like that. So um, a typical curve, I think, uh, measured from uh, muons on copper is shown in the figure. Could, could someone tell me what page that is? My pages aren't. It's the one after the, um, that one, page eight. Okay. And then you see this uh, characteristic behavior, a large increase as a function of, um, of gamma when the particle is slow, some minimum, which is called uh, minimum ionization, and then a logarithmic rise which is called the relativistic rise. And at higher energies, there's something called radiative, which I'm going to talk about a little later. So for most basic charged particles, the energy loss is at the minimum ionization level. Um, minimum ionization is roughly 1 to 2 MeV per um, Minimum ionization is something like 1 to 2 MeV per um, gram per centimeter squared of material. So 1 to 2 MeV multiplied by um, the density in grams per cc. And so um, if you have a particle that's not doing electromagnetic interactions or nuclear interactions, it's just kind of going through stuff. That's the ionization level you see. So for example, um, a muon going through water will lose a, about 1 MeV per centimeter. Now if you have a 100 GeV muon, it'll go through a very large tank of water or even a very large piece of iron. And so a muon will essentially go through any material that you put in its way. And remember, muons go almost a kilometer before they decay if they're relativistic. So um, those particles are then visualized in a detector like this, just like a track, although that track, if you have a magnetic field around, might be bent in some way. Um, now the question is, what, how do you visualize that track? Well, you need some active material which is sensitive to ionization. So for example, plastic doped with a scintillating compound that will emit light when there's ionization. Um, sometimes people use... Uh, liquid argon, so then you drift uh, electrons and pick up the ionization electronically. Um, there are various ways to do this. Sometimes you have a gas volume. In the SLD detector, they had a gas volume and wires. And a charged particle going through will deposit ionization, which is then, by electric fields, drifted to the wires. And then you measure how much charge is collected in each wire 
and actually also when it comes in. And so in the cross section, you have your wires, and then there are wires that are hit. And then by, from the timing, you know that the hit occurred on a circle like that, and then you draw something that's tangent to all the circles, and you get the track of the muon. An important effect for muons is something called uh, multiple scattering. Um, not only do you uh, lose energy, but also you have small momentum deflections along the path. And so if you want to do very accurate measurements, you have to account for the uncertainty that comes from that. I put in a formula the um, theta RMS, the RMS deflection from multiple scattering. Um, a characteristic number is uh, 13.6 MeV divided by um, beta Cp. So it goes down like 1 over the momentum with some characteristic number here. The charge of the particle, which would be 1 for a muon, and then the square root of the distance, because it's something that um, is basically an error. So it accumulates like a, the RMS of a Gaussian distribution. And it's measured in a quantity called x, which is the radiation length, which I'm going to define a little later in this lecture. Roughly, for a dense material like lead or iron, the radiation length is a few centimeters. So as you go a long distance, you will have some deviation in angle that goes like the square root of the distance, like a random walk. And so if you want to do really accurate tracking measurements, you need to have a material which has small numbers of radiation lengths, which means a very diffuse material. So basically, there are two strategies you can use for this. One is to have a big gas volume, because gas has very few atoms in it. And then the x is extremely small. The other, which is probably the more modern technique, it's not clear that it's really the optimal technique, but it's what people have to do at the LHC, is you use some material that has very accurate uh, point recognition of the track. So for example, you have uh, silicon chips which have planes with a water 10 micron pitch. When a particle goes through those planes, it'll deposit ionization in one layer, one line along the silicon. So you get a better than 10 micron uh, point location of the particle. And then what you pay for that is that silicon is more dense than a gas, even planes of silicon in a, in a vacuum volume. So um, you suffer more multiple scattering when you do that. For the kind of next generation experiments, the ones planned for what's called the International Linear Collider, uh, the plan is to use thin silicon. So uh, then you take your silicon wafers, you carve them down to a few hundred nanometers, and then you try and have some gossamer thing, which is still electronically active, that particles can go through. Uh, for the LHC, there's a, actually a substantial material budget um, between the interaction and the end of the tracking volume when you can do something else. And all that silicon in there has the property that it can mess up the next thing in line that the particle is going to see. Okay, now one more thing you want to know about uh, tracking is you can find out where the particle is, but you also want to find out how energetic it is or how fast it's going. And to do that, as you all know, what you want to do is immerse the tracking volume in a magnetic field so you bend the particle. The typical way to do that is to have, let me draw this picture on end, a tracking volume. And then outside the tracking volume, you have a solenoid. So there's a magnetic field in which the tracking volume is immersed. Then a particle will bend in that magnetic field according to its sign and according to its momentum. The bending, a convenient formula, is dPt dx is about 300 MeV over P. Um, sorry, dPt dx is 300 MeV per meter times the B field in Tesla. 
So um, a typical field is of order one Tesla. And so then you can get um, a full circle for a particle that uh, in, in a few meters of volume for a particle that has 300 MeV. For a particle that has 300 GeV, you're already talking about quite small angles. The way you measure the deflection is that you notice that the particle path, you don't know what direction it comes out. That's determined by quantum mechanics, so it's totally random. But the particle will go out and it'll curve in some way like that. And so if you recognize where it started and where it came out of the tracking volume and the deviation of that from a straight line, this distance here is called the sed sejitta. The um, formula for the sejitta is 1 half r theta squared, where theta is the bending angle. So that's um, something like a half times this number, 300 MeV per meter, times um, the characteristic quantity here is uh, B squared L um, divided by the energy of the particle or the momentum of the particle. And so what you want to do to get a very large sejitta or as large as possible is you have to either play with B or L. So you have to either make B very large or you have to make L very large. And needless to say, both of those are expensive. Uh, making B large, you have to remember that B fields have a lot of energy in them. If you have a large B field, you have to have your magnet well designed or it, the energy in the B field will basically cause the magnet to be unstable. And so you have to worry about all these things. Um, the CMS detector at the LHC has a magnet which is some, um, I think the volume is something like from my hand to the wall with a four Tesla B field. It's, it's truly impressive. And uh, it's a major feat of engineering to make a magnet that, 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 that's that strong and that large. Uh, typical kinds of resolution that you have, I think this is the performance expected from Atlas, is some um, Sigma P over P is something like um, 3 times 10 to the minus 4 P. So the resolution gets worse with momentum because the thing you're trying to measure gets smaller and smaller with momentum. And then that's folded with some uh, kind of intrinsic resolution that comes from multiple scattering uh, at the percent level divided by the square root of uh, sine theta. So for um, and p in these formulae will always be in GeV, which is our characteristic unit. So this is something like um, uh, percent level or part per mil level accuracy in the minimum determination. Maybe I should also say that for a very energetic particle, for example, if you have TeV energy particles at the LHC, you may not see enough bending to distinguish the arc from a straight line. In that case, you also can't tell the charge because the charge is given by the sign of the bending. And so at the LHC, for the highest energy muons, um, you actually can't tell what charge they are, although you have pretty good charge recognition above 3 TeV for muons. So it's, it's only a worry when you think about really the most energetic collisions you're talking about. Um, now, as I said, one can visualize this in various ways. And one of them is to um, put uh, basically planes of silicon at various levels. And then you have hits in the silicon, which give very high precision tracks. Now, one of the things you can do with that is if you can get your silicon very close in and have very high precision in the tracking, is you can... Um, recognize that there are particles with short lifetimes which nevertheless become visible in that way. And there's an example on, I guess it's page 10. So page 10 gives one of these characteristic E plus E minus to Z zero events. And you see it's a complex event with two streams of 
tracks going in opposite directions. So it looks exactly like the events I showed you before that corresponded to the Z decay to a quark and an antiquark. However, if you blow up that picture, so now you see that little circle in the center of the diagram. If you blow up that picture so you get to that circle, you see what's on the next page. If you go to the next page, then the inner circle there is about two and a half centimeters from the interaction point. And what you have there are CCDs, uh, basically the kind of silicon devices that are in a digital camera. So it's a two-dimensional pixelation. A charged particle will deposit ionization in a single pixel. And so then you get a, a three-dimensional view of the event as the particles go out through the CCD array. And if you look very carefully at that picture, you'll see that the tracks are actually coming from three different locations. There are some tracks that come from the center. Then there's another set of tracks that come from some point over here, and another set of tracks that come from a point over here. And those points are separated by fractions of a centimeter. So remember I told you that um, for the tau, the tau had a lifetime of order of picosecond, which was of order a tenth of a millimeter. The bottom quark, the B quark, will live a whole one and a half picoseconds. And then with a relativistic time dilation, it'll go a substantial fraction of a centimeter before it decays. And so you remember how big this detector is. It's four stories high. In a four story high detector, you have to detect the deviation of a vertex from the interaction point, uh, this from this by a few millimeters. And if you can do that successfully, you can actually recognize bottom quarks. Now, there's more to say about this. It's actually kind of an interesting study. Um, the, what you're trying to do is to measure the distance between this vertex and that vertex. Or if you, another way to think about that is you can measure an impact parameter. Um, you take a track, you extrapolate back. If it doesn't go through the primary vertex, there might be a distance here which is the impact parameter. And you have a late decaying particle if you have a finite impact parameter. So you can look for Bs. Um, that's, uh, as I said, of order a centimeter um, for charm particles the C quark, the charm quark, a few uh, millimeters, or for a tau, a fraction of a millimeter. If you can recognize that, you can see these heavier particles that are intermediate states that are decaying to lighter particles. Um, there's a very interesting picture, which is two more down, which is the attempt to measure the impact parameter resolution. And there's actually an experimental technique to do that in situ. Basically, what you do is the following. If you have a track with an impact parameter, so here's the primary vertex. Then you have some track which has a finite impact parameter. You can attempt to sign the impact parameter by looking at the tangent, sorry, the perpendicular. Maybe I should blow this up a little. the perpendicular from the impact parameter to the vertex. And this perpendicular can either correspond to a point that's ahead of or behind the vertex in terms of the direction of the track. So we would call this a positive impact parameter and this a negative impact parameter. Now, a positive impact parameter, a negative impact parameter, is almost always the result of mismeasurement. The fact that there's some uh, measurement error in the position of the track, so the particle doesn't precisely go through the vertex, but it has a little deviation. But this gets contributions both from mismeasurement and from having particles that actually go some distance and then decay, uh, producing a displaced vertex of the kind that you saw in that picture. So what you see in, I think it's page 10 now, is that right? Page 13, I'm sorry, is the distribution of impact parameters 
from the OPAL experiment, which is another of these experiments that measured E plus E minus to a Z0 decaying to quarks. Um, the data are the dots. What you see on the negative side, um, it's a log scale, is a Gaussian distribution with a somewhat longer tail, as you see, than a Gaussian. What you see on the positive side is a big excess of events. And then there's a fit which is done which attributes that event to the presence of these bottom quarks for which the particle actually is produced at the vertex. It goes a finite distance, it decays, and it leads to tracks with a positive impact parameter. So the negative side of the distribution measures the intrinsic measurement error. And then any excess on the positive side is related to actual decaying particles. So in that way, you can actually persuade yourself that you know what you're doing. OK, um, there's one more chapter in detectors, which is uh, calorimetry. It's just about 10 o'clock now. Should I save this for next time? OK, um, let me just say a few words about this, and then I'll go through it all next time. So, so far, we've just been talking about particles traveling through material without interaction. But now, if we want to actually measure the energy of a particle, we want to take advantage of the fact that particles actually interact. And so, um, and in particular, there, there are some particles that we haven't seen yet. So, so far, any particle, um, roughly any particle that's relativistic looks like any other one. But in particular, we would like to tell apart muons, electrons, pions, and let me just say photons, which are not yet visible to tracking. And so what we want to do is to take advantage of the fact that this guy has electromagnetic interactions. This guy has basically no interactions, even though it has, you know, in the, in the equations, the same interactions as the electron because it's heavier its electromagnetic interactions are very much decreased. And this one here has strong interactions. So roughly the setup for this is the following. You have your tracking volume. You then have some material here which has a strong, which, has, which allows large electromagnetic interactions. And then photons and electrons will produce signals in this part of the detector. Then you have something at, so this is something like lead. And here you have something like iron. And then out in the iron, the pions, so electrons and photons will go through, the, will be stopped in here. Muons will go through the whole thing. And pions will make interactions in the iron over a larger distance. And so by having devices one after another in that way, you can separate all the components of the particle reaction and measure the energies of each of them. And uh, let me answer this question, but I'll tell you more about this next time. Yes? Um, Yes, but what I want to do here is an electromagnetic interaction which more or less totally converts the energy of the electron into a signal. So the tracking measurements are non-destructive. The, the electron or the muon brushes by atoms. It kicks off a lot of low energy electrons. All that's doing, hopefully, <coughs> is telling you where it is. Now, there is multiple scattering, as I explained. But in principle, what you're trying to do is to disturb the material as little as possible. You just find out where the particle is, and you watch it bend. Now we're going to do a totally different type of measurement where the electron goes in, and it doesn't come out the other end. But some signals come out that tell you what the total energy of the electron is. And my claim is that the same technique will work for gamma rays, so or photons. So you can also, you can't see the path of a neutral particle but at least you can figure out where it ends up and how much energy it has. And then we'll try and do the same thing for hadrons. So the formula for that I'll give you next time. 
Any other questions? Yes. Um, yeah, um, there's some experiments that are interested in what the spin of the muon is. And so then you need a huge amount of material to stop the muon. And you need to do that in such a way that you don't depolarize the muon. So it turns out that chalk is a material that does that. And so, or, um, uh, yeah, calcium carbonate salts. So, um, so there was an experiment, uh, a neutrino experiment done at CERN called CHARM, where the main uh, material in it was a chalky rock, which stopped muons without destroying their polarization. And then you watch the muons decay, and then you can measure the spin of the muons. And that checked some aspects of weak interaction. Okay? Good. More on this next time, then. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>